I'd like to call the Comprehensive Plan Update Work Session number 22 to order. Heather, if you'd please call the roll. Mr. Granger? Here. Mr. Boswell? Here. Mr. Klee? Here. Ms. Macbeth? Here. Mr. Edwards? Here. Mr. Schaller? Here. Mr. Tarley? Here. Um, the primary point on our agenda today was going to be the review of the Parks and Rec chapter of the Comprehensive Plan. However, before we get to that, um, which is why I think most of you are here, we're going to be hearing a presentation by Watercrest Williamsburg. Um, so I invite the applicant to come forward and give their presentation, please. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the Commission. For the record, my name is Andy Scherzer. I'm a landscape architect with Balzer & Associates. We happen to be a multidisciplinary firm in Richmond, Virginia that has worked with Watercrest Senior Living in the last several years to work on a facility there. So the reason why we're here today is to pursue or recommend that the Planning Commission consider recommending that the modification of the comp plan be allowed to be considered to allow an assisted living to go on that northeast corner basically of Henry Street and Route 199. We have a team of people here today with us that could answer most questions you might have about the project or certainly past projects. Mark Chilcott is a representative of Watercrest uh, Senior Living. Ann Miller is a planner in our firm. Don Balzer happens to have been retired from our firm about 15 years, but he is proposing to develop approximately 12 single family lots. He's been working with Watercrest Senior Living on a similar project in Richmond where they had some interaction in terms of the development of that property. So we're here, I'm going to probably talk in a conversational style. This isn't, it, it is a presentation, but at the end we're certainly willing and able to answer any questions we have about the type of product this is, what's envisioned, and, and where we are in the process. The other thing I wanted to say, Watercrest Senior Living has 10 facilities open. They started, I guess, in Florida and are moving northward. We're working on several projects in Virginia. There, uh, Mark could probably tell you about more about those, but they do have a website, and there is extensive photos and documentation and, and uh, sort of a, a, a walkthrough of their facilities. You can see exactly what is envisioned here. We have a few points and slides within our PowerPoint that also will sort of give an indication of that, but you can dive into it as deeply as you might want to to determine what type of facility we're envisioning on this property. I'll get used to your system. I'm not that technically sophisticated. I apologize. Um, oh, right one. Sorry about that. This, as what we have here is obviously the board for the existing land use plan that's shown. And we have an area where right along, it's not actually fronting on 199. There's a parcel that would be in, it's in between our property. And as we get to the larger scale map, uh, we'll see that we're separated from 199. We're a little bit into the property is where the uh, independent, excuse me, the assisted living is envisioned to have. And then there are some scattered lots a little bit further north from that. Right now, it's currently zoned RS1, which allows single family. And there's some old platted lots that are on the property. We're envisioning, you know, at least within our property, abandoning those. And the sole use that would go on this property would be an assisted living and then also these 12 single family lots. But that couldn't obviously happen until we went through the whole rezoning process and then the whole entitlement process involving engineering and environmental studies and the same. So all we're asking you all to do is consider this modification of the comp plan so we know whether it's practical to pursue that in upcoming months and years probably. So the next one is we're about a little over 21 acres and you can see where it's located. And obviously, you all look in the front. And I apologize, it's a little disorienting to me. Um, but it, I've sort of talked about most of the items. Uh, one thing I will say, within Watercrest, they'll have approximately 30 um, memory care units. And those are in the one-story buildings that's closest to Henry Street. And then behind it, as the land drops off, it becomes a multi-story building. And that is assisted living. It's not independent living. Approximately out of most facilities that are about the same size, they have one or two people that might still be holding on to their driver's license. Sometimes it's a, you know, a husband and wife that might be there. 
and one might have it, but it's generally, they usually have given up their um, driving privileges by the time they go into this type of facility. I think the average age is somewhere around 85 or 87 years old is the average age for the people that enter in this process. So there's very little traffic that goes along with this project because it's solely the 30 or so people on any given shift that work there. Plus, obviously, it's hopeful because the location to be within the community that there'd be plenty of visitors, but the reality of it is there's only about 300 trips per day spread out through an entire day is, is what would be envisioned from this. This is a little bit more deeper dive. You can sort of see just a schematic layout. Just realize these are just very, very preliminary plans, but what we wanted to show you that this use could fit in, on the property. It generally is going to be located on the, up at the higher ground property, and there's RPAs, or resource protection areas, as many of you all know, basically interweave throughout the site. Only 65, excuse me, 35% would actually be part of the development area. The rest, 65%, would actually be not touched at all or not envisioned. There is a proposal that we provide easements both along Henry Street as well as along College Creek to allow for a path system extension. So obviously that would be an exception, but that would be part of the municipality providing and doing those improvements. So, but it'd still be very modest in its impact on the environmentally sensitive properties. Um, to the north, obviously, some people may know the Oaks on Henry, the townhouses are across the street. We would envision just three access points at this point, one for the single family, and then there would be two. One more or less a service entrance because the way the units are set up or the way the program is set up, everyone has dining facility privileges. You have, that's where all the meals are taken. So there is not like independent living here. So we do have a, a kitchen and staff that prepare that, so we have a service entrance for that. And then the main access is, I guess, to the south and southeast, the first entrance off of Henry Street would be where the entrance would occur in that location. This is a little bit deeper dive into the actual assisted living. The brown area closest to Henry Street is that one-story area that's tied to the independent, excuse me, to the memory care. Once I learned this in process of the past projects, I didn't know that, but generally having noise above your head is just really disconcerting to memory care patients, so it's only a one-story facility in order to provide the best standard of care and how they're oriented. They have an interior courtyard, so they do have an outside area that's very secure. Um, again, if you do the walkthrough through the, through the um, website, you'll see how the security is set up. It is first class. I happened to go south in Florida to see um, spring training games, so I visited several of their facilities just because I was so curious. They're wonderfully, amazingly non-institutional. This is a beautiful place, and it's, it appears that the residents very, really very much love their facility and, and are appreciative of the type of atmosphere that's created there. You can read the descriptions as well as I can probably say them, but you have a one-story lobby and a common area where you have little bistros and dining halls and um, other service type areas in the yellow area as you enter from the drop-off circle. And then as you have a wing off the back, that's where the uh, assisted living facilities are. These don't have full kitchens. They're just, you'll have a microwave, maybe a little mini refrigerator, but that's solely how the units are set up. It truly is, people are, are fully cognizant and active, but the Bottom line is they need help with some services, and that's why this facility is provided for them. And I will go ahead and say, Mark, if you, I misspeak about anything about the facility, you jump up and correct me right away. Um, this gives you, a, uh, the architect I believe is um, Dwell, and I believe they're from Northern Virginia. They have expertise in this use of these. They created these cross sections that show sort of the relationship. You have Henry Street, then there would be a preserved 50-foot buffer, and then there's a little bit of the parking area, so you all can read the, the cross-sections and see how it steps back. So the first building is that one story, then you sort of have a one-and-a-half story with the taller ceilings for the public spaces, and then you go back to the three story as it drops off on the back of the property. It respects the rules and, of the road that the city of Williamsburg has in terms of heights and requirements, and we feel in our analysis of the site that we'll be able to stay well within normal standards and 
and meet what industry and what your community has desired for these types of facilities of sizes and impact and how they relate to the street, we feel that how by laying it out this way, we really provide and be a good neighbor to people that are used to seeing the road the way it is and how it's been developed in other portions of the frontage. On the back, at the nearest point, uh, or at the point nearest this particular portion of the site, I think there's about 700 feet of undeveloped area between the rear of the assisted living and, and College Creek. I know that might be of interest to some people. I don't know, I, maybe somebody can point and see as you come down, you, there's an art resource protection area that goes back behind there. As you get to the single family on the other side, you have at least that minimum of a 100 foot RPA. I believe it's a little bit larger that as it encompasses both those, the resource protection as well as the steep slopes that exist you know, on the site. I'm sure most of you all know this far better than I do, but wanted to make sure we, we feel it has been, is it responsible to the community at large, and they want to be a part of the community because the people that are here aren't coming from outside, they're coming from the community is where the demographics of today, this is the future for some of us. I, I just turned 60 last year, so I'm in the, I guess, the demographic profile as it moves forward through and it's, it's, the studies have shown at least what Watercrest has explained to me and what I've read in you know, periodicals is that it's much healthier for people to stay in their community instead of being pushed off to isolated areas. So. That's why they're here located in the community. This is the cross sections we said before. This is a sort of a mass model, so you can sort of see how the lay of the land, you can, the contours are indicated, I believe. As you can read this, you can see how Henry Street lays in and then how the building steps up and down, I guess, on the property. And this is just in order to be able to helpful to show how it is reasonable to think that this could fit on the site and still protect and respect the environmental sensitivity of it. Again, sight lines, because you all know probably better than anybody, you know, Henry Street goes in and you have sort of a cut down bank and much of the cross section along there. So the sight lines, by the time you have the 50 foot buffer as well as the enhanced plantings that would, I imagine, would be required by standard planning and development, we feel most of that initial area will be obscured or, or certainly limited in terms of view and the impact as you drive along Henry Street. So we feel we will be a good neighbor that way. And so this cross section that the Dwell created sort of shows that relationship. These are some of the, this is symptomatic or shows what the latest, I guess, watercress entities how, how they're appointed, how they are, their appearance, and what they look like. And this is what we would imagine it would be the same type of portrayal in this facility. Obviously, it's a beautiful community and neighborhood, and we would imagine it would maybe adapted for our Virginia sensibilities and certainly the Williamsburg sensibilities. But the quality of attention to detail and the lack of institutionality, we feel it's putting its best foot forward. And again, I'll tell you, you know, go and look at the website. You can peruse it to your heart's content and see exactly how it is because it's, it's built. It's physical. It's not something in the future. This happens to be the design that was put up for the one project we worked on in, in Richmond, in Midlothian, sort of out near Swift Creek Reservoir, another environmentally sensitive location. And it's all, you know, traditional materials, hardy plank, brick, uh, and different types of pavers, et cetera. This we would imagine as you develop the palette through the zoning process and discussions with planning commission, staff, and the community, we would develop the palette and the look that would match for Williamsburg. This unit, ha this happens to be a little bit more in like a V that has two wings as opposed to the one wing that goes out, so the architecture changes, but the attention to detail the movement in and out, outdoor porches, the, that shows that there is a commitment to a quality building and an articulated building. It's not, again, just plunking in a warehouse on a street that sometimes people are concerned and worried about. This is, I believe, Richmond Hill. These are photos we envision the 12 single family lots would be much identical to that. We can develop the standards in the sizes and the quality of architecture and the requirements 
would be developed through the zoning process, but we just see this as an extension and a typical um, extension of the market onto that, and it'd just be the dozen homes is what's envisioned at this time. This shows a little bit of what the proposed trail system is. This is a diagram we just sort of highlighted by, if you look in the middle right, I guess you can see the ochre or the yellow area, that's where our site is. The Capitol Trail, I believe, or Ann may be able to help me. There's various um, extensions of the Capitol Trail in vision, whether they're alternate routes or future spurs, shown coming through along the James River, then coming up to the site and extending along Henry Street. So we're showing that we would, our trail extension, the easements we provide or the, whatever we would be able to build in isolation would be part of the community and would tie it together, much in keeping with most, in, most um, community standards want to have the pedestrian connection everywhere because it's better health, it's better vigor, it's, and it just makes for better neighborhoods. And I'm through all the way to the point of asking for questions. And I do want to make sure you know that the other staff is also available. It's not just me. And uh, we look forward to trying to become a good part of your community. So if you, I'd appreciate if you'd stay up there um, so people can ask questions as we go forward. Presentation. Um, I really appreciate your, your presentation and your um, uh, sensitivity to Henry Street, which is uh, one of the nicest entrances in New Williamsburg, really. It's uh, beautiful. 199 own. Um, and I, I appreciate the buffer and the, the location. And also, I don't think you can be able to see much of it from 199 at all. Um, part of the purview of the Planning Commission is archaeological review, and this is an archaeological review area. And I just want to make sure you're aware of that. And there have been no archaeological surveys on that property, uh, as far as we know. So, um, that, staff, Carolyn has advised us as such, and right. obviously this is the first step on a long journey. Right. But we understand that might be one of the next steps should <laughs> we have an inkling that it would be productive to spend more time on this project. Right. That accurate um, part. I'm, anybody else? I'll just, I'll just um, I'll echo Mr. Edwards that this is, this, I'm, I'm so glad you, you came here and gave us the opportunity to hear this before plans got you know, really, uh, uh, I guess, cemented um, your, before your proposal got, got too far along because the opportunity here in Williamsburg especially to get community input, as you can see, is very important. Yes, sir. I think I saw 2.6 uh, car trips per day per unit. Um, that may have been, that's what I guess past studies have indicated, yes, sir. Um, how many total units are you looking at again? 110, it'd be 30 of the uh, memory care units and 80 of the independent living. Okay. Uh, not independent, assisted living units. Okay. Now, some of the units, a few of the units have two bedrooms because sometimes if it's a husband and wife, they need to have separate rooms. I know I snore, that might be the reason. I don't know, Mark might be able to advise that other than that, but, um, but those are very few of the units and that's just how it's set up. They do have a track record, so the traffic impact is both taken from national data as well as from the data that Watercrest has itself. I think the ITE provides that type of data also, national traffic engineer, transportation engineer. I was glad to see that you um, recognized the environmental sensitivity of the site and that you were able to speak briefly to your experience working on a similar site in Midlothian. And I'm wondering if you could share for, for everyone here what those steps look like typically and what you expect to see included, uh, incorporated into this project. Um, we're just in the entitlement phase, so we're working on development plans, but the Upper Swift Creek or Swift Creek Reservoir is one of the reservoirs for the county, and they have higher standards for nutrient removal. You have to the the, the, the state has very stringent standards today, and Williamsburg may have even more. I apologize, we don't do a lot of work here, so I don't know the ins and outs of the engineering standards. But because they were so they have such stringent requirements, you have to have a combination. I think we have. 
bioswales and sand, different filter systems, et cetera. And then in addition to that, there's downstream, we call them BMPs, best management practices, water quality facilities. There's one within our site, right on the front of the site. Actually, it'd be similar like being on Henry Street, but it's not a, it's a new road, not a past road. I mean, not a historic act gateway. Well, we're trying to make it more of a, an aesthetic benefit for the community, for this particular community that it's setting in. So it's a, you have to do multiple strategies in order to meet any of the Chesapeake Bay Act requirements today. So I wish I could tell you I knew every, every specific one. There are certain tree cover requirements today where you get, you're actually, you're, you benefit by doing the right thing. I mean, it's, you, you almost are forced into do it one way or another in order to meet the water quality standards, not only for our specific local jurisdiction, but also statewide. Um, so it's like today's standards are like exponentially more difficult than the beginning of my career. This is my, probably my 35th year in, in doing this sort of thing. And it's, it's, it's amazing. It's actually, um, it's pleasant to walk away from a project and know you've done your best and knowing you're, you're being as good a steward as you can be within the rules that are within the system. Thank you. Well, as you know, we just received these packets today, so it's sort of like drinking from a fire hose. And I'm certain. To, I'm sure there'll be a lot of questions later on, but um, uh, a couple that I had is one, uh, your market need. You know, can you address that issue? That probably is outside my expertise. I would let Mark Chilcott speak up if you want to. Um, all I know is that the demographics of the baby boomers aging are affecting everything in terms of the retirement communities. And so it's undeniable that there will be a long-term need. Now, whether or not there's a specific need at this location, I can't address that, but I will let Mark try and do that. Can you come up to the microphone? Because even though we have mics, I can see some people are straining to hear, so I'd appreciate if you'd come up. That's a good question. My name is Mark Chokot. I'm with Watercrest Senior Living Group. And, um, and I am responsible for the real estate development for the company and, um, and happy to answer your question. Um, when, when we come to any community, um, whether it's in Florida or Georgia or South Carolina or Virginia, um, we are um, making sure it's needs-based, meaning that there is demand that is over and above the existing supply. That's, that's in the community. We really want to become part of the fabric of the senior living industry in that community um, because there's such a need for diversity. And we take a section of that that is, is, is a higher end product. It's, it's something where the residents in the area, um, should they choose to come and, and live at Watercrest, um, it would be a transition that they would be very comfortable with and their families would be very comfortable with. And so we take a look at, you know, a five, seven, and ten minute drive and, and we also look at the greater market, but, but we focus more on the immediate core market. We call it a trade area that's there. And in this area and within a five minute area drive of this, there is a need that exceeds supply both in the area and in the greater market as well. So we, we are coming because there's a need to this community and then we want to come and be a neighbor and, and honor and serve seniors as well. Second question then I, I would have, but decide who answers it. Um, <laughs> what is your time frame, best case, worst case scenario, you know, that uh, let's say a recommendation gets made and, and happens the way you want it to happen and with the doors open. Um, so it's, it's a little bit of a progressive discussion because um, these steps, as Andy pointed out, are, are not just a comp plan modification but rezone and then your normal site plan approvals. And so there's an entitlement process that, that could occur between now and potentially the end of the year as we all work together um, through this. And, um, and, and then our typical construction um, is roughly about for a project like this could be 20 to 24 months. Um, so, you know, we're talking two and a half, maybe three years um, when the doors open from now. So, so a lot of work between now and then and, and a lot of working with the community as we're doing that as well. Thank you. 
And so thinking about the staging there, which I hadn't thought about before, because again, for everyone who's come, we're just seeing this for the first time ourselves right now. So um, is there a staging of single family houses relative to the assisted living facility? Is one seen as the benchmark or your foot, foothold and the other being secondary? I mean, well, um, you may have to redirect this question in case I answer it wrong, okay. um, but they, they are separate and unrelated projects um, there. So, so the housing, the 12 units, would not be independent living or units that would be associated with the assisted living. They're, they're two separate projects. Yes, I, I understood yeah. that piece, um, but would both parts of that project be actualized in the same three-year horizon, oh. or is it staging out in a different fashion? Yes, well, um, some of that's to be determined as we work forward, but they would both happen in the same planning window. Likely the residential would move a little quicker because it's less complex. Other? I think what might be helpful, because I've heard this before, this is a different model in terms of how some assisted living memory cares are tied to a continuing care mm -hmm. community, residential oh, yeah. community. Right. This is independent, and I'll let you talk about what how it works within the community that way. Well, um, as you know, the continuum is really moving from, you know, kind of age-targeted or active adult, multifamily, independent living, assisted living, memory care, um, skilled nursing. And, um, and our, our core and our focus is primarily the assisted living and, and the memory care. We actually build the facility so that it's, it's, it's extended stay and we staff accordingly so that we hope that um, um, sh um, whoever comes with us never has to make a choice of moving to a different facility um, there. And, um, and then as it relates to, you know, um, our collaborative nature with the other communities, if there are active adult or if there's independent, um, we're all working together and, and helping each other in that respect there. But, but this will be solely memory care and assisted living and doing that in excellence for the community. May I ask just a, a follow-up? I guess I'm, I'm seeing a disconnect. I understand, understand the memory care, you know, if we all have parents and grandparents. Uh, but what's, what is Watercrest's connection then with these 12 single-family homes? I mean, going... Well, that is, that's exactly why we have um, Don Balzer here, who would be developing the, um, the residential. I mean, it's all part of one project um, or one property, and, and there is the opportunity to develop. Um, and so it's two separate projects, but how on the front end they work together is there's an interrelatedness financially of how they work together, both in the site development, how they work financially, um, because this... The site, um, and as, as you know, the site is very, um, it's a unique, beautiful site that has numerous development challenges, whether it be topography or, um, or other challenges that we have to work with. So it will be more expensive development. And the opportunity to develop the single family will contribute towards the basis cost of the assisted living, and it just helps make it all financially feasible. So it works together in that way, even though it's two separate projects. Nothing, nothing. It's all one parcel. Yeah. But one parcel. Okay, gotcha. Right. So I'll follow up on that. If if uh, if the residential lots weren't developed, would you uh, pursue the memory care unit and vice versa? Yeah. I mean, those are um, those are what if questions, and and we're we're as we all acknowledge, we're at such at the beginning of the uh, the front. We we really think that both projects are. Our projects that are, there's a need for it, they would be um, awesome projects for your community. I don't know how to answer that until we journey a little bit further in the process. You mentioned the, the and Chair Beth asked about the need, or somebody asked about the need for the, the assisted living, um, but what about the need for the additional homes? Uh, the 12, 12 more, I guess, relatively, that will be relatively expensive. Uh, single-family homes um, is there a is there a need for that in the city yeah so to be truthful um, we haven't done a specific market study for that and um, and and I think we would probably at, at this stage all of us would say 12 lots in this location um, 
there's highly likely a need, but we would underpin that with, with studies and demonstrate feasibility. Where we have um, focused our initial feasibility, and it's been both in-house and third party, has been on the assisted living and memory care. It's, um, it's, it's, it's quite an extensive investment. It'll be a 30 plus, plus million dollar project in your community. In there, so. Other questions at this time? Okay, well thank you. Thank you. So at this point, I would like to open up um, the open forum section of this meeting to talk about the presentation. I do have speaker cards, and if there are more speaker cards at the entrance doors, and if you want to fill out a speaker card and provide them to Heather or to Carolyn, they can be um, brought up to me. I'll be calling people in order. We also have a timing mechanism that I see, but I don't see the timer out there for the people. So. Um, there's a lot of people here, and I'd like everyone who wants to speak to be able to speak. So it's a five-minute timer. Do you have the Do you have the thing to, to turn it over? Okay, I'll set up my, my. Okay, but you have the controller to. Okay, but you can start the one that I see. Okay, so then I I will then just, you. Yours is locked down. I'll give you a 30-second warning if you're actually going that far. You're welcome to use your five minutes. You don't have to use all of them. If you, you know. um, but I would like to, so I'll give you a 30-second warning, and I'd really appreciate if you would conclude, if you're still talking at that five-minute mark, to, to you know, tie your comments together so that your neighbors can also speak. And if after everyone who wants to speak has spoken and you want to come up a second time, we will let you do that as well. So just for the betterment of everyone in the community, I'd appreciate if we could move through that like that. So my first speaker card is from uh, Tim Murphy. Please, and as you come forward, can you actually state your name and your address for the record? My name is Tim Murphy. I live on Crown Point Road in the neighborhood. I live in Kings Point. Um, I speak in opposition to this proposal at this early stage because it envisions a dramatic change of the land use and land properties in a residential area. And what the applicants propose is a for-profit commercial enterprise in a current residential area. In order to accomplish this, they're going to ask you to change the comprehensive plan. And then when that is accomplished, then they're going to ask for a special use permit for an LB4 category special use permit. They're going to take 12 lots of 21 acres and convert those into 110 units, $30 million, and they estimate 300 trips a day. A commercial enterprise in a residential area on a street that if you go from Newport Avenue to 199 on that side of the street has no businesses, no commercial enterprises, nothing but residential areas or undisturbed lands. We've got the College Landing Park. We've got all the wetlands. We're on the shores of College Creek and this makes no sense. So I would suggest to you in the early stage to discourage these folks from their two or three year enterprise of $30 million. A special use permit requires a special requirement because it might have undue impact or might be incompatible with the current residential uses. And among the standards for a special use permit, which is this the ultimate objective, um, this body and the, and the board must check and see whether it, whether it will have an undue impact. And among the standards that you should apply and will apply is whether the new use must be in harmony with the character of adjacent properties and the surrounding neighborhoods. No commercial enterprises, no for-profit enterprises, no barber shops, no shoe shine shops, none of those things in this proposal. I'm not sure it's adequately serviced by uh, current public services. It's going to require sewer and water and drainage and offsets and all of those things. 
But the most important criteria here is, is the proposed use shall not result, not result in the destruction, loss, or damage of any feature of that property determined to be of a significant ecological or historical importance. So if they get the comprehensive plan of alterations approved, they'll have their nose under the tent, and then they're going to come back to you and ask for a special use permit. They're doing it in this environmentally sensitive area, in the resource protective area, on the shores of the creek, within walking distance of the landing park. And it, in fact, will diminish the, the quiet enjoyment of all the folks in that area, all the folks that come in on a, on a special corridor into the city of Williamsburg. It'll diminish the quiet enjoyment of the people in the Oaks and everybody that drives from 199 into the city. It'll diminish the use of the creek. It'll, it'll diminish the people that seek some quiet and solitude on College Landing Park. This proposal will be in, in view of the College Landing Park. It'll have significant traffic implications. There'll be ambulances going there at all hours of the day and night. The ambulances will be, fo will be followed by fire trucks. And it just, at this stage, makes no sense. You're going to hear from dozens of people that will tell you all of the reasons why it ought not to be uh, promoted any further. It ought to be discouraged, it ought not be pursued, and it not, not pre preoccupy your time. I'm, I would be happy to have these people become the fabric of the senior living community in Williamsburg. I'm in favor of uh, assisted people. I'm, I'm afraid I'm a... I'm in favor of assistance, I'm afraid of living, but I'm not, it doesn't make any sense in this location. If you go to your LB4 category, the category says, You're at 30 uh, seconds. In this, land use is intended for areas including Strawberry Plains, John Tyler, John, Strawberry Plains, John Tyler, Monticello Avenue, and Capitol Landing Road. So the way this thing works, with all these developments, these developers want to privatize the profits. They want to make profits over, as a result of their $20 million investment. And then they want to socialize the cost. They want the taxpayers and the neighbors and the people that, that use this facility, uh, to, those people to incur the cost, to incur the hardship from, from, as a result of this project. So I feel strongly about this. I understand it's at the very early stage, but I think you guys ought to send these folks packing, send it to another location. If we need assisted living facilities, there are a lot better places where they can do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Murphy. Okay, hey, I'd like to um, call Robert Doors. That's me. Okay. I remember I addressed you all on January 15th in uh, asking you to support the long-standing goal of the city to build the sidewalk from the park to the Oaks, and I just wanted to thank you again for your continued support. I had a, a little speech planned here. Uh, Mr. Murphy, was it just now? Yes. I, uh, uh, he's touched on some of it. Andy, you've touched on some of it. Some of it's been touched on. So um, this is good. I don't need as much time. I don't, um, I, I don't presume to speak for uh, all of my neighbors, though I've talked to most, to 80% of them this week personally. Uh, and some of them, in the interest of saving you time, have agreed not to speak today and have sent me notes, data, questions, and stuff, which I've incorporated here. So, uh, so that's good. And I don't presume to speak for anyone from the other neighborhoods at all. Um, but I rise here also in vigorous opposition to changing or eliminating any of the language from the comprehensive plan concerning long-term goals for protected areas and park lands in the vicinity of College Landing, and in opposition to any action to rezone the land included in this development proposal from the current RS zoning for single-family dwelling to LB4 limited business corridor status. Uh, we've been living under the Oaks, whether we knew it or not, for a long time uh, under 
with the knowledge, well, with or without the knowledge, that we could have residential development happen there at some point. But I understand that all the developers that have looked at it for residential over the years have looked at the forbidding terrain and decided that for the number of houses they could get in there, uh, which is not that many, um, the cost of putting the infrastructure in was just, it, it dug into the profit margin, and they've all walked away over the last 25 or 30 years, so I'm told by someone who should know. And um, so this is, you know, if they can cram a lot of people into an assisted living center and, as Mr. Murphy said, make a killing on it. Um, and he also touched on this uh, idea of rezoning it for LB4, which is what they'll be requesting, and he touched very well on the fact that even if it were, right now, even if it were already develop, uh, zoned RB4 for resident, for a limited business, they couldn't go in there and build on it without getting this special use permit. So, um, so you're right about that, Mr. Murphy. Um, in terms of the natural resources, some of that's been touched on. The city's own land use map color codes the entire area in ninja green which on Williamsburg land usage maps apparently means environmentally sensitive. Also, in order to accommodate Watercrest proposal, they would have to abandon, and this is key for us at the Oaks, key for me as a person. You, to accommodate these people, you will have to, the city will have to abandon its long-standing, long-term goal of purchasing that tract of land to preserve as parkland. As stated in your own Comprehensive plan of 2013 on chapter 11, page 23, proposing that this tract should be purchased by the city and part of it connected to the college landing marsh walk and the rest preserved as open space to maintain South Henry as a scenic entry corridor. And then the city plan further proposes that those parklands that I just spoke of be linked to all the other adjacent uh, natural areas to create a much larger municipal ecological park and there, it's a bold and creative vision, and there's a beautiful color drawing of what the city proposes for a huge South Henry, Henry Street uh, nature preserve down on that end of town. I encourage you to look at it. Uh, it should be noted there are no properties currently zoned for large commercial development immediately adjacent to the land in question. We've already talked about what they would need, including the special permit to uh, do to build this thing, which normally would not even be allowed to be built in a LB4 zone unless you got the special exemption from the city. And on top of that, the city owns three quarters of an acre in there. And I've been told, yes, if, they, if you all approve this, the city will be required to sell the land that the city already owns in there. It's in the way. And I will not appreciate, that's, I don't mean to get that agitated about it. I just, I just would not like to see the city turn over any land that we already have control of in that highly sensitive, by all of our measures, sensitive area. So uh, that's just an, another little aside. Development will inevitably increase impervious surfaces in the area, which will increase stormwater runoff into the adjacent waterways. Those waters are currently listed on the Virginia Department of Environmental Quality's Impaired Waterways Mapper as partially delisted. That basically means that at some point those waters at College Landing were considered impaired. We're coming upon time. The fact that the waterway is now partially delisted means the water has improved, new stormwater runoff and inevitable increased sedimentation caused by this development could have a negative impact on those adjacent already improving waters and on the James River not too far away downstream. Is it too much to ask that the people who asked me to speak for them and share these points raise their hand just to show you who they are? Is that out of order? If you like, but we need to have you wrap up this. And I'll no, quit no, no. right That's there. That's fine. That's fine. You're... I'll quit right there. Would anyone like to? My two points, I'm in favor of not changing the language to preserve and create the parkland, and I'm not in favor of rezoning to allow any commercial development on South Henry. Anybody else interested in that? <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, I'd like to call Nancy Carter. Nancy Carter.
Hi, thank you. I'm Nancy Carter. I live in the Port Ann neighborhood on William Way. I wholeheartedly support the previous two uh, persons who came up in opposition of this project for the reasons they described, but I have five additional factors I'd like you to consider, and I hope you uh, tell these folks this project is not appropriate. <clears throat> My house actually is just off the top of this, and I can see the 199 bridge, but my house is probably three times as far away from 199 as the proposed facilities. That traffic is noisy. The speaker from the company says their memory care patients are sensitive to noise. Yeah, it's very noisy up there. And I, I looked at this project and I thought, well, next thing you're gonna to wanna to know, they're gonna to wanna to put a sound wall up there just like they have in other places on Route 199 to abate the noise there as well. So it's, and the noise never stops. The cars are there 24 seven, truck traffic on there, et cetera, et cetera. I don't think a noisy place for those sensitive patients is appropriate. Um, the gentleman never mentioned, uh, he said there was a need in this area for that type, the type of product they propose but uh, I'm aware of at least two others within a few miles. There's uh, somebody proposing uh, some housing down at Quarter Path, and the paper had uh, a big project approved down on Route 60 in York County, just around the corner, to provide, to turn the shopping center into senior housing. So boom, 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 there's, two other projects, plus we have the landing, so if these folks had their way, there would be four projects. Boom, 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 right along 199, and I don't think we want to do that. Uh, a gentleman mentioned, from the company mentioned uh, putting in sidewalks so folks could walk around and be a part of the community. Well, I know myself from walking up and down the road, it's a almost near close to two mile walk from that corner up to Colonial Williamsburg. There is nowhere else to walk. You can't walk along one, Route 199. It's unsafe. And I propose, suggested to you that the folks who live in that kind of facility aren't equipped to walk two miles to go somewhere. I, it's a very isolating spot. Why not put them in a place where they can walk to something like a coffee shop or something where they can socialize as these other projects clearly are in better locations for that kind of environment for their occupants. Um, I talked about the uh, tra traffic on 199. When traffic turns off of 199 onto South Henry Street, a lot of them is moving very fast. Do it myself a lot of, a lot of times, I try and be careful, but I noticed the driveways they're proposing are all on curbs, not great sight distances. If these folks have this project in there, persons with perhaps not so great driving abilities are gonna be turning into and off of their property right on curves with short sight distances. I don't think this is very wise at all. Um, I, I mentioned I did live in Port Anne, and we're, I have many of my neighbors here today. We're well aware of the sensitivity of living right on College Creek and the marshlands and the streams. Whenever we want to build anything or we have a project, Chesapeake Bay administrator comes down and, and we're measuring to the foot, you know, where our projects go so we don't adversely affect the waterways and the wetlands and et cetera. And I, I think these folks don't appreciate the great care and attention that's given to preserving the ecology in this area. Something else to think about is that in our neighborhood, we're used to our homes. They're, most of them sit perched on the tops of slopes and the land slopes down to streams and wetlands and things. The soils around here erode pretty easily on those slopes. I know myself and some of my neighbors have experience of spending quite a, a good amount of money shoring up the foundations of our driveways and our homes because the land erodes quite easily. And this is only in the 30 years, give or take, that Port Ann has been there. I can't, I looked at this project and I saw how big that building was. And I'm sure there are smarter engineering people than me, but to how to hold up that heavy weight and that foundation when you have these sandy soils and sl steep slopes 
it kind of boggles my mind. So uh, that's my two cents worth, and again, I speak in opposition, and I wholeheartedly support the two previous speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Danny Schmidt is next up. And we have some information that he's provided us at our desks. All right, so uh, good evening. Um, thank you for providing us with this opportunity so early in the game. Uh, my name is Danny Schmidt. I reside at 218 South Point Drive. Uh, I think I'm in my fifth decade uh, here. Um, and I'm going to start off by wasting some time and brown nosing. I just came off the James City County Planning Commission after four years of service uh, this past month. And I want to thank you because I know this is hard work and oftentimes we are tasked with making challenging uh, decisions. So thank you for your service. Um, it's much appreciated. Um, and a lot of things have already been um, touched upon, obviously. But I just want to go back into sort of my deep memory. And some of my earliest memories of going from Kings Point into the wonderful city of Williamsburg are, of course, through this beautiful, iconic entrance that Mr. Edwards already touched upon. Not only is it iconic and meaningful and sort of a powerful uh, immersion into the um, Colonial Williamsburg and College of William and Mary experience, but it, it's ex an extremely historic route. And by land and by sea. And so I do firmly believe that such a change to the comprehensive plan and then the rezoning and then the SUP would, if we get to this point, we have blighted an incredibly valuable resource to the city. These entryways matter. Imagine yourself as a visitor to our region. We still have, we're, we're hanging on to them, but we still have the Monticello entrance with the College Woods on either side. We still have beautiful exits off the Colonial Parkway, a national park, into the city. And we still have South Henry, among others. And I think we should cling to these and for as long as we can. And this is actually, like, I see, many of us are here because we see this as a problem. I, where I see the problem, I see an opportunity as well. Because here we are talking about what we've already figured out. The city of Williamsburg already pegged it. This land should be acquired by the city to expand on the Capitol Landing Park, which protects our historic and cultural resources and at the same time protects that visitor experience. Why are we here? Why do we live here? We all live here because of basically two institutions. That's Colonial Williamsburg Foundation and the College of William & Mary. I do not think the leaders of those organizations would be the least bit pleased if we headed down this path. Uh, what else? This is the only place as it stands now that the city of Williamsburg can access, uh, it's, uh, I call it our portal, our great escape, our tidal resources, our waterways. And in the plan, comprehensive plan 2013, there's talk of building a nice kayak launch there. Great idea. And I think if we, there's a lot of land moving that's got to go on because of the topography here. 199 came in. It silted up a lot of areas along where the Kings Point Club is. Uh, then they added to 199 more silting. They're going to try to mitigate that, of course, but we know that sometimes fails. Uh, I'd hate to see us lose that opportunity to have a nice la launch there due to silting. And again, it would sort of blight the view from College Landing Park. That uh, dock there is only, um, you only have another 150 feet to go if the city acquires this land. One could expand that dock. Uh, to access hiking trails, et cetera. I, there's, there's all sorts of great ways we could go with this resource. Um, now, uh, I brought to you, have in front of you, um, the James City County. Before I came off the Planning Commission, um, we were and we still are in the midst of reviewing our comprehensive plan. And we sent, we, we uh, contracted a firm uh, connected with the University of Virginia to survey the James City County populace um, and the part of the, plan, the, the um, survey I pulled for you is, uh, talks about our survey methods, so sample size 3,000 we got, 
Um, we got over a thousand uh, responses back. And the part that I wanted to share with you and the folks here in the crowd today is the satisfaction with services. Guess what was number one? James City County Parks and Recreation Facilities, Programs, and Services overall, 94.6% somewhat satisfied. I would wager that if we ran a similar survey through the city of Williamsburg's populace, we would get back similar results. You too have amazing parks and rec facilities. We have Waller Mill, we have Kiwanis, we have Readout Park, we have College Landing Park, just to name a few. Uh, so um, I think that's about it. How much more time do I have? You have 26 seconds. 26 seconds. <laughs> you guys are not bad guys, all right? You're not bad guys. We, you're not bad guys. You're good. We're all good guys. So I do want to say that assisted living, while I do think it's a need, I did approve several assisted living facilities in James City County during this time. You got, the city is kind of boxed and there's not, land is finite, there's not a lot of resources. Think of this regionally, don't worry. The county, your county, James City County, we've got your back. There's, it's in the works. Assisted living is coming. We're going to be all set. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for bringing back, us back to the stated agenda of the meeting, which was Parks and Rec. Um, but, um, okay, my next speaker card is Sarah Muffelman. Good evening. Uh, I'm Sarah Muffelman, and I bought my home in the Oaks in August of 2019. I wanted to live in this neighborhood because I could see trees looking out both my front and my back porch. I also wanted a peaceful and quiet neighborhood, and I'm very happy here. However, allowing a development on a commercial scale across the street would negatively affect the aspects of the neighborhood that drew me here. After seeing the schematics presented today, I would like to comment that I live in Unit 2. It is among the units closest to Route 199, directly across from the proposed assisted living facility. My home is very elevated, and I anticipate my view would be directly negatively impacted. I would not have purchased my home in this neighborhood if I thought a commercial facility would be built directly across the street. I ask that the commission deny the application for this proposed development and that you deny the request to change the zoning to commercial. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to call Josephine Krantz. Good afternoon, my name is Josephine Krantz. I'm another Port Ann resident, nine Frenchman's Key. I think half of our block is here. Um, and I'd, I'd like to address, uh, I agree with all of the, the comments that have already been made, but I'd like to address the subject of uh, the traffic um, because I think it's um, very much underestimated and it doesn't take into account the additional developments that are going on, or that are supposed to be going on along 199, including the development at the uh, Holly Hills Carriage Homes, the additional development that's going in there. And I understand when I called the Planning Commission this afternoon that they expect the revised plans for that development to be coming in um, within the next few months. That's supposed to be another 30 to 40 townhomes. And when you add the, the traffic from that, which is only the next intersection, to the contemplated traffic that would be engendered by having both the 12 McMansions, it looks like, um, and the assisted living facility, particularly for the staff, our inter intersection at 199 and South Henry Street is going to see a heck of a lot more traffic. It's an intersection that already has issues. The left-hand turn lane, we were just discussing this, the left-hand turn lane, the eastbound lane, to turn onto South Henry Street is way too short. You can actually see it. It's an accident waiting to happen. That's 55 mile an hour traffic if you're lucky and people are not speeding, and you have to, there's not enough room for us to slow down 
if there's anybody else in that lane to turn left onto 199, you have to slam on your brakes in order to get into that left-hand turn lane. And if you're going to add, I would say the 300 trips a day is grossly understated because you've got to consider both of those developments go going in. We are going to have a mess at that intersection. Um, the presentation is not what we were expecting today. Um, so the rest of the comments that I had planned are actually in inapplicable. But for, for traffic reasons, if, if nothing else, we are in opposition to the rezoning of this for commercial development. Thank you. Thank you. My next speaker is um, Jim McDonald. Madam Chairman, thank you for the opportunity to speak and to the chairs. Um, if I was on the Planning Commission, I guess I'd ask myself, well, uh, is there some place this place could go that I wouldn't have to change any of my zoning? And I kind of think there is. I mean, I, we've been trying to develop uh, Capital Landing and Quarter Path Park down by Riverside Hospital. It seems to me that would be a wonderful place for this. I don't think this is the place. If you look at all those trees that are gone, all the ecological stuff, we're really concerned about the creek. We see it silt up more and more. This isn't going to help it, I'm sure. And I just echo everything else that was said. It's what's impressive to me is, number one, we have great people who take on the task of doing this job and also uh, residents who are articulate and able to uh, say what I think all of us agree. That is, from my perspective, fine people, great company, really impressive with what they have. I'd like to see them here. I'd like to see them at Riverside, uh, over by Riverside Hospital. I think that'd be wonderful. Thank you very much. Thank you. My next speaker is James Carter. Good evening, Madam Chairman, members. Uh, my name is James Carter, and I'm a resident of the Oaks, and I have been for the last 25 years. I'm also an attorney and the owner of the Carter Funeral Home in Newport News, Virginia. Uh, I wanted to talk about the effect of having a commercial enterprise which has two ingresses and two egresses on a downhill blind corner. The topography at the top of South Henry, where these ingresses and egresses are currently mapped out, is a downhill curve, and you cannot see that bottom ingress or egress from the top of that street, and you cannot see the top one from the bottom of the street coming up. Currently, people travel at speed, at 35 miles an hour, approaching the top of South Henry Street. And when they're coming down, you cannot see the, the, the turn, and they're making a rapid right turn from 199 onto South Henry Street to get out of the traffic. When you come at 4 o'clock in the rush hour, you will see that traffic backs up at that right turn lane, and then everyone's aching to make that right turn to get onto South Henry Street. If there is an ingress or an egress right there at the base of that curve, there's going to be traffic congestion. As people are going to be coming in and out of there trying to turn on Henry Street, the people who are coming down South Henry Street are going to have to stop to allow them on. It's going to have a blind curve with two entrances, and one of those entrances is right by my daughter's bus stop. At the bottom of the oaks, right there at the base of that hill, there is a bus stop where my daughter waits. And it appears that on the other side of the street, we're now going to have a commercial entrance where all of the commercial trucks for this facility are going to be entering and exiting. I own a funeral home. I can tell you that these are 24-hour facilities. And they're not just people who are shift changing. There are linen trucks that come in and out. There are garbage trucks that come in and out. There are Cisco trucks for the food, for the, for the cafeterias that come in and out. And there are also funeral homes and ambulances that come in and out at all times of night. 300 trips a day, maybe, maybe not. But at any rate, anyone who comes in and out of that entrance or exit is going to have to traverse that blind curve. And it's going to be a problem for people coming up that hill at speed to see people coming out of that driveway. So I urge you to stick with the current plan to maintain the green space the way it is and not to alter it in order to put a commercial enterprise at that corner where there's a blind curve. Thank you. Thank you. My 
My next speaker is Ed Chappell. Chappell. I'm Ed Chappell. Uh, I live at 601 Pollard Park here in, in Williamsburg. I, I want to just kind of reinforce uh, one of the principal points and maybe uh, carry it a little further. Uh, the visual and environmental health of Williamsburg is so obviously essential to the community here, including our economic health. Uh, what everybody says they want to move to Williamsburg because of its special qualities. A verdant, green, and natural route into town is extremely important to all of us. The uh, position of this project between College Creek and South Henry Street uh, adjoining Ca Capitol Landing Park, hopefully to be expanded, is a very poor choice for the development. The natural topography would require kind of classic inhospitable land moving. It'd be an eyesore to Henry Street and to College Creek and would not be good for water flow, natural water flow. 50-foot um, buffer is insufficient, particularly in winter, for any kind of visual protection, and the, the traffic lanes in and out would pierce that, so it would be highly visible. I'm very sympathetic to the need. I embrace the, uh, the function, but the point is, is that the comprehensive plan and zoning are in place uh, to help us make intelligent decisions about the development of our community. This wouldn't be an intelligent um, decision. Uh, so I encourage you to oppose the project um, and ch that would require changing zoning and a comprehensive plan. What is said, what, hundreds of thousands of times at least is, how great it was, how lucky we are that W.A.R. Goodwin and John D. Rockefeller were so far-sighted uh, that they saw what this community could be. Um, we owe them a great debt, along with the Park Service, which partnered with Rockefeller to create uh, the, the, uh, the Colonial Parkway that provides another uh, verdant link between the three great sites of Jamestown, Williamsburg, and Yorktown. Um, these people were great thinkers, but it's our responsibility, our generation's responsibility, to protect and preserve what makes our community special. We can't rely on those who died 50 years ago. This is really our responsibility. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker is Jack Schmidt. My name is Jack Schmidt. I live on 33 Frenchman Ski, also in Port Ann. Uh, I agree with everything that's been said. The only things I would add are two. One is I read the uh, Chesapeake Bay protection uh, areas that act specifically would exclude putting up the single family homes as they are marked here. Uh, they are within the Chesapeake Bay Protection Zone and, and the act specifically precludes building new housing in that zone. It, it allows for modification, for upgrading under extreme circumstances that, that are on things which are water based, which these are not. So I don't think that it is consistent with the Chesapeake Bay Act to propose the residences that are there. Second, I would like to doubly reinforce the uh, point that was raised before from the man on, uh, from the Oaks about the access points. This map here looks, it looks flat, and when you add in the curves and the hills that are there, uh, you are guaranteeing accidents on South Henry Street to put in three uh, egress points in that very limited area, and it's just a question of time before you are having accidents there that you don't want. That's all I've got. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Heather, Carolyn, are there any more cards that you have? No. Okay. Um, I don't have any more speaker cards, but that does not mean that you don't have the opportunity to speak if you'd like. It's just that you have to 
organize yourself on who comes next. So if anyone else would like to come forward and speak to the commission on any points of this matter that they feel need to be amplified, please come forward to the microphone and state your name and address, please. Hi, my name is Nina Bassiano. I live on 25 Frenchman's Key. Some of my neighbors have already spoken. I am totally in support of everyone who has come to this microphone and spoke and spoke. I want to just give you a little bit of information that I'm aware of that they did not share with you, okay? In retirement communities, okay, I'm going to be blunt, okay? If you look, if you Google, you will find that the last 30 days of life is where the most amount of money is spent on human beings, okay? Do you understand what I'm saying? The last 30 days. They never mentioned anything about having an acute facility, which most people go from assisted living to an acute care facility. And I can tell you for fact that that's where money is made in nursing homes. So what I'm telling you is that not all those residents will be able to stay there. They will be sent to acute care, unless, of course, we find out down the road that maybe we need to add some acute care beds for our residents. Food for thought. I'm not saying they lied to you. I'm telling you what you could Google and find out just to help you out and to give you a little heads up because I think you're going to make the right decision. I just thought I'd give you a little bit more information of some areas that I'm used to. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward? My name is Dennis Swartz and I live in Port Anne. I'd like to know who owns that land up there. Why is it being sold to this company over here? As the a gentleman already mentioned, the hospital, near the hospital there's plenty of land. And it, it, I wouldn't want to be next to a hospital or near a hospital if I was there. And the thing about it is the economics of this. If anything goes wrong at any particular time, it all fails. The houses don't sell. The other, the institution there, the retirement fails. If that fails, the housing doesn't get done. It's too much. I'd like to know what the economics are here behind it. Are they well funded? Uh, who's selling the land? What, what's behind all of this? And I certainly don't want it there. Because if it does fail, can you imagine what it looks like? It might look like that uh, up the road there is a big empty area that used to, that supposedly was going to be all kinds of uh, businesses going in. And you got about three now. So that's my question. And, it, it, and I'm definitely against it. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak? Let's, let me just ask, does anyone else who hasn't spoken already like to come forward to speak? Okay, Mr. Dowds, come, please come forward. I don't, know, but I don't remember whether I introduced myself. I'm Bob Dorries from the Oaks. Um, to his point, and this was in my summary statement, which I just didn't really think I needed to say, but he, he brought me back to it. I have sympathy for the property owners. They're owned by a couple of families. The city owns three quarters of an acre, I think Carolyn showed me um, in there. One family owns the bulk of it, I, I think, and would, you know, 
So, so it's owned by different people. But I, I know they've been paying taxes on this for all these decades. And because, as I said in my earlier part, they have not been able to get a developer to do anything with it because it's not worth their while financially. The bottom line is, really, honestly, I know you'll say, oh, that's a lot of money. But the only satisfactory solution, leaving the senior citizen center off of that property, the only long-term solution for everybody's satisfaction is the city buy the land, like it's our intention to do in the comprehensive plan. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak? Please come to the microphone so everyone can hear. Oh, Eureka. <laughs> um, the, uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be the city. I would, I would think that the uh, College of William & Mary may well be interested in acquiring this property as well because what a great amenity for the student body to be able to access our tidal waterways. That's all. Great. Thank you. Would anyone else like to come forward and speak? Seeing no one, then I will close the open forum section of this meeting. Um, before we end this section of our agenda here, um, are there any other discussion points that commissioners wish to have at this point? Any statements or any comments? Any questions to the applicant? Not at this point? Okay. Okay, um, well then that will conclude our discussion um, of the presentation by Watercrest Williamsburg. Um, the agenda item that had been on this meeting originally was the Parks and Rec Draft 2. Carolyn, did you want to start that or do you want to postpone that to our next agenda meeting? Okay, I mean, our, we're scheduled to go from, from 4 to 6. I just didn't know if we needed more than the next half hour or so to do this. Okay, well then, um, so take a break, get a glass of water, and um, you can do the electronics. Move the uh, okay. PowerPoints. Thanks. Thank you all for coming. We, pre we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Before yep. Aaron starts in on this section, um, basically in the first section, the commission had a couple of changes to the, the parks by switching uh, a couple of parks and designation. So I did that. I took the, uh, the city square and moved that into a community park. I think that was one of the commission's uh, 
request, so the map will reflect that. And you, as you know, I, I corrected the minor changes that the commission had. I also added uh, at the end of the park section, there was a question on to add the adjacent jurisdictions, some of their parks into the, uh, the this section, and I, I, I added those into that section. So I think this first few pages that you've got are basically just updating what we discussed at our last, last meeting, and Aaron's going to review the, uh, the pages in front of you, which are the new pages to the... Uh, the park section on trying to finish up this section and I'll turn it over to her to to start with these slides so the last few pages of the parks and recreation um, chapter discuss the recommendations and goals that were identified in the parks and recreation master plan that was done last year um, they had a whole planning process and had a number of uh, community forums to identify you know things that that our park users wanted to see um, and then they also had uh, independent firm come in and kind of do an assessment of the existing facilities so I'm going to go through the recommended improvements for those facilities um, and then we'll kind of get into the goals that were identified in the in the master plan one of the ones you're going to see kind of consistently across the board in all the parks is increasing ADA accessibility throughout um, and that that's just kind of a general statement that we're going to see in almost every park. Um, you'll see in a number of them, they also identify the need for ADA parking spaces. Um, some of these parks are community parks and folks might be walking to them, but they may not have a parking space for folks that don't have the ability to walk to those parks. So and we'll start with Bicentennial Park, the ADA comments, um, improvements to site furnishings, ADA parking, pedestrian entry on, uh, on Newport Avenue, pedestrian entries on Nassau and Court Streets, and pedestrian entries on South Henry and West Court Streets. And those entries, they're just identifying that they're not exactly um, the most appealing kind of draw into the park, and that some of those entries actually do need ADA improvements to them. Um, so that just means a curb cut and a, the, the little, what do you call them, the dots in the yeah. sidewalk? Mm -hmm. Um, for College Landing, and uh, just stop me if you have questions about any of those. For College Landing, again, the ADA accessibility, um, the installation of a kayak launch, an observation or overlook pad, um, access to the, to the pad, um, and that includes ADA access, and I guess the improvements to or extending the boardwalk area that's there right now. Um, I think that we had mentioned it previously, but with the higher tides that we're seeing, that boardwalk is often submerged. Right. Um, and I, so, I was wondering, the, was, is that what that was referring to? That yes. needs to be yes, is to improve yeah. that 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 location and and probably elevate it a little bit more. Um, then we go to Getty Park, and that is primarily ADA um, recommendations. Highland Park, ADA recommendations, the internal steps to the park, um, the plan identified as kind of failing, um, and they, they really need to be replaced or improved. Um, the swings need to Excuse be replaced. Me. Yes. I'm sorry. Uh, if you, and obviously I'm late to the show here since no uh, this is my first time through this, but the Getty Park, I mean, what does ADA accessibility throughout mean? It essentially means that there's a surface that uh, a person in a wheelchair or with a walker could could comfortably navigate the park system. Just changing the surface that's there. Exactly. Yeah. Um, is there a real demand for wheelchair access to some of these neighborhood parks? And, and I ask particularly about Getty. I, the, the, there's a couple of them where, you know, they're really sort of it's leftover land. And by calling them a park, uh, I suppose that maybe triggers a, a, a sense that they ought to have a, a better accessibility, but there really are just kind of empty parcels that are undevelopable or um, for other reasons not ever going to be developed. I, I sort of put Getty in that category, and I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not quite as familiar with some of these others, um, but I think it is worth just talking that through a little bit. Strawberry Plains and Wales, I think, might fit the same category. Um, even the parking, I'm not sure where at Getty, for example, yeah, no, where that parking I, I, I would go. Yeah, I had questions about Getty as well, because I see that as this sort of natural spot that is people walk their dogs there and things like that, yeah. but the idea of actually putting a Paving. paved sidewalk through there for 
ADA compliance for what is really just a just natural a land lot right. that's been saved there. And I think going back to the previous hour and a half of conversation, I mean, there's value to saving natural land lots and somehow forcing ourselves to have to put pavement through them. You know, it just seems like there's countervailing measures here that it's, it's hard to make it say that every single thing that we call a park has to have these pavements. So without going back th through the methodology that I think I understood when I read through the master plan, they identify these improvements as something that if the city wants to make this a park, mm. if they really want to improve this facility, that these are the things that would need to be done. Um, it's not necessarily saying that this has to have this, but it's saying that if the city wants to develop this into a neighborhood park with facilities or something like that, that the first step is going to be making sure that you have ADA accessibility to the park. And that came up across the board throughout this Parks and Rec Master Plan, both for existing facilities, for these neighborhood parks, for Waller Mill Park, is just to make sure that there's, there's ADA accessibility. It may just be kind of a blanket boilerplate language that they use for their parks. Um, I, I can't speak to, to what the the uh, plan developers were, were thinking as far as that goes. And my but, only question would be whether it was a legal requirement. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, and there, there may be some, there may be some, I know for um, like the intersection improvements that were identified at Bicentennial Park, the city has to do those. And we're mm -hmm. working kind of progressively as we go through the city to do them. Yeah. Um, for these smaller neighborhood parks, I'm not sure. I wonder if there, there's the possibility of delineating between an active park and a passive park. Um, because Getty Park, um, it, it has evolved over the last uh, 25 years that I've lived in that neighborhood into a park from just the vacant land. Mm -hmm. But it currently has a very deep gravel, pea gravel path. But there has been a bench that's been installed there and, and some brick pavers in front of the bench. and. Uh, trash can and the city, uh, I assume the city manages the trash receptacle there and the dog waste and things like that. But it's it's not an active park where you would expect kids to come and play. Um, and so I think delineating the difference between an, an active park and a passive park might be an opportunity to create a different standard. So the, the way they're listed here is strictly in alphabetical order. We could certainly go back and kind of break them out and say these are the active parks and these are the recommendations for active parks and these are the passive parks and these are the recommendations for the passive parks. And if that helps kind of um, delineate where, you know, the need might be, it might be we might need to, you know, put our resources more towards the active parks when we know we're having a lot more interaction with the public, not that we don't need to make improvements to the passive parks, but that the priority might be to, to go towards active parks first. Yeah, and I think Correct. that, I mean, I think we were all very sensitive to the fact that, you know, we're all aging too, you know, and that we also have, you know, we, do, we, we know the demographics of our community. I mean, we're part of that as well. Mm -hmm. And so I'm not saying that I think don't think we should have ADA accessible parks and you know that we're not trying to you know differentiate who can use parks but I think there is this aspect of highest and best use of different parks and so maybe realigning this in a different way to which are like parks that are destination people actually you know drive to these parks and things like that versus the dog walk park so another another thought let towards me, let me that ask, let me ask one more thing just, just to benchmark before you mm -hmm. Incorporate all that to John's point. You know, when when we put ADA there, when we say ADA, I mean that's a federal statute that has those requirements that, that John was asking about, and so we need to have that information here too. That that we're doing this because of federal law mandated the changes, or it's not. You know, so so there's a difference between ADA requirements and we're just making it accessible because we you know we don't have to, but we're going to. You see what I mean? Yeah. May I add one more point, to sort of add, building off of that idea that. Right, there are these legal requirements that we aren't, at least the non-lawyers of us, aren't <laughs> as familiar with or as aware of. And certainly I wouldn't want to, this conversation to get mis misconstrued and made it sound like we don't want ADA accessibility. Um, but I do like this idea of maybe prioritizing all of any of these improvements to passive versus 
what we might consider more active, sort of more well-used parks. The other thought that I had is perhaps a recommendation of the Planning Commission could be that where we do do this for compliance with ADA, that perhaps we suggest that pervious pavement is used so that at least, you know, we're not necessarily, certainly there's some character changes that would still occur with any pavement, but at least we're reducing sort of the immediate environmental impact of paving. Mm -hmm. Especially, and in, in the more passive parks, the pervious is even, it seems like it, it gives you double benefit there. Right. It seems less intrusive, yeah. Yes. So kind of further thinking, reorganizing these, earlier in the chapter, we, we discuss each one of these parks individually. Mm -hmm. It might be possible to, to, at the end of each one of those kind of discussion points, to put, you know, recommend Im improvements from the 2019 Parks and Recreation Master Plan include, and then we can put each one of these sections kind of earlier into the chapter so that we discuss the park, we discuss the improvements that have been done in the park recently, and we can discuss the recommended improvements all kind of in the same section mm -hmm. per park and the parks are broken out by passive and active earlier in the chapter so that might be the best way to kind of incorporate everything yeah I think what we want to avoid is the appearance of making a recommendation that does something that diminishes rather than enhances an individual park and I think you're hearing a consensus up here that paving through Getty paving through, I guess Minor Park isn't listed in here in the, in the in the improvements, but Minor Park I put in the same sort of category, right? The little triangle that's that's out here mm -hmm. um, at Capitol Landing, um, and probably the Wales Park, and probably I think there's maybe one other that sort of fits into this category, whether we call it passive or um, something else. That the paving wouldn't actually, and an extra parking place wouldn't improve anybody's enjoyment of those parks, they would simply be additional pavement out of a sense of um, needing to be consistent. Um, so I, I, I agree. I don't know what the solution is, um, but I, I, I too, the one thing I was going to, the one comment I was going to make was about the ADA stuff in here. And obviously, uh, again, um, sometimes it's absolutely called for and essential. And I think we can go further than what the law requires uh, by doing it where we don't necessarily need it. But I think these very, very small parks uh, that get very occasional use, that's almost entirely neighborhood-based, um, it may not be called for. We probably won't use the term ADA only where it is required. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Oh, sure. Yes. Just call it accessibility improvements. Accessibility improvements. Mm -hmm. Okay. We'll work on the language for that and, and okay. kind of... I think we'll add them back earlier into the chapter so the improvements are recommended, or the recommended improvements are incorporated with each park discussion. Because um, I think that that will, will address some of those concerns automatically. Um, so back at Highland Park, there was um, recommendations to replace the swings and to address some issues at the basketball court wall and the bench area. Um, I think that Parks and Rec is working on those currently. Um, as part of the master plan, they kind of gave a, a priority, prioritization of, of improvements and kind of biggest bang for your buck kind of improvements, things that should be done, could be done easily and quickly, and I think that, I think that those two things are on their list or on their radar right now. Um, at Kiwanis Park, we had the ADA conversation, the vehicle entry at the tennis courts, um, and the tennis courts is missing there. Um, tennis parking and the tennis building all are identified as areas needing improvement. Um, at Quarterpath Park, the vehicle entries for um, well, they identify them as two, three, and four. The essentially where they where you come off Quarterpath um, needing improvement, and, and I would think that that has something to do with some paving and. and <coughs> possibly widening one of them, but I'm not sure. Um, a three-court tennis complex. They also identified um, needed improvements in the locker room building. At Readout Park, they um, discussed the need for stormwater infrastructure at that location and improvements to the Tuttle Trail. Um, and 
Wales Park, the pedestrian entry, I think that that's, again, um, an accessibility concern, but also just a general improvement to the property. Waller Mill Park, um, this was a, the, this is a, a big one, um, and I can tell you that I know that they're working on two or three of these right now because they're, um, they were, they were funded in the current budget cycle, so they're making improvements to, um, one of the shelters. They have made some amenities improvements. Oh, sorry about that. Um, they uh, identified needs to address uh, the parking for shelters two and three, and um, to address the old restroom facility and storage. Um, the storage, I think, is just, uh, they need more of it, and, and the, the facility they have is just not adequate for what they, what they need to have out at the park. So in addition to those recommended areas of improvements, the master plan identified some goals. Um, and they kind of broke them out into four major sections and then gave them some action items underneath of those goals to, uh, to kind of make, make those a reality. Under goal number one, they said to add a new and improve existing infrastructure and amenities. Um, obviously, maintenance and improvement of what the city has already is, is certainly a priority to explore and improve, uh, explore improving and adding bike lanes, bike paths, and walking trails, um, and pursue connecting to the Capitol Trail. I think that we could probably also include, and I think during the development of this plan, we were, they, we hadn't really finalized the Birthplace of America Trail stuff yet, and that certainly still is a little bit up in the air, but I think we could add that to this list. Um, explore adding open spaces and improving natural area preservations. Explore adding splash pads and or a destination playground. Um, and this, is, I think, is in response to some of the destination playgrounds that James City County has installed and the amount of um, visitors and, and um, use that those places get that the city could certainly benefit from, from doing the same. Um, develop a departmental ADA transition plan, and that's to address all of the ADA concerns um, throughout the park system. And then to develop additional indoor recreational facilities and amenities. Um, just a question, uh, and I guess it fits within those broad categories, and I don't know how the surveys were done, you know, to come up with these particular suggestions that we have. But uh, one thing that I see missing out of all of these are, are like dog parks. Yeah, I know there's one, at, and I don't have a dog. But I do know that, you know, with the younger uh, generation, that there's a lot of dogs and there's a lot of interest in that socialization thing. And I know James City County has expanded from what they have now, and I, I don't know where that fits in, if there, there have been any discussion about that. I don't think that the goals specifically call out the need for dog parks, but I do know that that was, was discussed in the master plan. What staff anticipates doing is kind of like what we've done with the vibrancy plan, um, that the, the Parks and Rec master plan will become an appendix to the comp plan. Um, but I can certainly look and see if there is specific language that we could incorporate, um, not necessarily in these goals, because these goals are directly from the plan, but maybe under the recommendations that go into this chapter um, is, is, is to look at the addition of or expansion of dog parks for the city. It, it does make difference for, for you know, the uh, younger generation of moving to a particular area, what, what, what amenities are available, and that's one that uh, I've seen and experienced. Is, is, and like I said, James City County has hit a couple more other than the one that Freedom Park maybe has one that they've expanded to. And we have areas that seem like might be a bit other than Waller Mill, which is kind of a ways away. I'll, I'll look into the language that they use in the, in the master plan and see where else we can incorporate that in, into this chapter. So there's a couple more goals on the next page, or a couple more items identified for goal number one on the next page. Um, one of them is to develop other outdoor recreational facilities, so that could probably tie into that. Um, it doesn't, again, specifically call out dog parks, but we can, I think, add that language. I figured it was in that catch-all. <laughs> um, to continue to pursue opportunities for sports tourism. 
um, and to consider, explore adding public art in parks and recreational facilities. And the city kind of does both of these things currently, but I think it's it's encouraging the city to kind of stretch a little bit more and, and see where where else we can we can improve. For goal number two, it talks about the continue, um, continued improvement of programs and service delivery. And this is kind of internal, um, how, you know, how they process things and, and make things happen in Parks and Rec. Um, to continue to monitoring participation and usage of programs, facilities, and services, and making adjustments uh, as necessary um, based on collected data. Later, I think in another recommendation, it talks about the incorporation of a Park management software system, which I think will help with um, those those kind of monitoring um, requests. <clears throat> Excuse me. And to enhance special event programming, the Parks and Rec folks do a really good job with this, and I think that the the plan identified all of the the extras that they do to to help incorporate or to help uh, get our our residents and visitors kind of engaged. Um, but this certainly encourages them to, to continue to do that and expand upon that. Um, to explore opportunities to increase fitness and wellness programming. To continue to work with other service providers to develop programs and services to meet demands um, and trends. Certainly pickleball probably falls into that. Um, continue to monitor the affordability of programs and services. That was one of the comments that um, they received back on the surveys was the affordability of programs and the costs that are associated with them and to monitor staffing levels and available space. And certainly, um, Quarter Path Recreation Center is, is a great example of that. I, I think there's a number of folks who, who like to play pickleball and would like to see more of that space available. Um, and I think they're making some improvements to some outside areas to accommodate that as well. I guess I'm not entirely clear on why a lot of this is gonna be in the comprehensive plan. I mean, it's internal to Parks and Rec and important, but is it, I'm not, I guess I'm not seeing the connection with. So these goals are identified in the Parks and Rec Master Plan. And we, Carolyn and I kind of had a conversation about this earlier. You know, this, this might be something similar to where we, what we talked about in the Vibrancy Plan, that the Vibrancy Plan kind of gets into the nitty gritty of stuff. And I, I think it's important that the Commission see these recommendations and discuss them, whether or not they need to be the final document needs to include these, I don't know. And that's, Unless, that's... Did you want us to be giving you feedback on that as we go, or how, or just... Yes. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Please. Okay, 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 I got you. So, yeah, that's, yeah. so that's my general, yeah, so that's that's my that's my general thing, but, I, you, know, um, you know, increasing fitness and wellness programming doesn't seem like something that's going to require, you know, our, plan our voting, you know, I mean, that, that, that's right. just, just for example, and, and quite a few of these as we're going, and I'm just wondering what I'm, what I'm missing. I understand what you're, you know, what you're doing, because some of them clearly are going to be um, you know, things that we'll be, we'll need to be involved with at some point, but a lot of it doesn't seem like it. Yeah, and, and for me, I, I, I think amp to amplify what you just said, um, in looking at this, I was starting to feel like we were like spinning around, but from 11-12 with the, the good piece of this final five, six, five pages of the chapter is that it, it does something that we asked you to do, so you know. <laughs> now we're like spinning around in a different direction, but we definitely wanted it to be clearly articulated that all of this is from this Parks and Rec master plan. It isn't something that we came up through our brainstorming or public hearings or whatever kind of thing. So we now have captured it separately, but um, and so I, I guess I have a sense of like, but, but is so we have a 200-page document that's now six pages, something like that. So how much do we want to cut? But then. That goes against what we said 15 minutes ago, which was in the parts that where you're articulating the different parks, you're going to blend that back into the park descriptions, because I, because which is what we said we didn't want to happen. So, I think that between those two pieces of it, we all need to decide what we want kept separate, you know, called out, because I don't think you want to have it called out at each park. And the Parks and Rec Master Plan said this, you know. Um, so we're involved with capital improvements. So I think all of the the improvements to the parks, the things about parking, and you know all of those all of those things are certainly you know if it, if it's capital improvement, it needs to be you know we need to make a recommendation on it. Um, if it's uh, you know about expanding pickleball, I'm not sure if the planning commission needs to make a recommendation. So if, yeah. it's, if it's lifestyle <laughs> parks and rec, mm -hmm. 
up topics. And, and I do think that throughout all of this, the casual use of ADA versus use of accessibility or you know sustainability issue. I mean, we need to be very careful in the language so that we don't you know, corner ourselves into having to do something. So do you do do you want to continue to incorporate these goals? Would it be more beneficial to say that the Parks and, Rec Re Parks and Recreation Master Plan identified three goals? Just include those goals and then have those action items referenced in the appendix. So, so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna keep throwing out my opinion because nobody, okay. nobody told me to shut up yet. But, um, so so. You know, we've we've got these 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 other you know we've got the vibrancy plan, we've got these uh, these recommendations, all of which are valid, but they all exist. You know, uh, and they're all accessible on the city uh, city website, and you can go see you know, the city building, see them. I'm not sure that they even need to be appendices to the comp plan because that's just generating more. You know, it's just putting the same thing in you know so many so many different places. What I think from this, we need to look at the you know, anything that involves a capital improvement that the, mm -hmm. the Parks and Rec is. Uh, is recommending, and you know, I, I certainly haven't seen anything in that category that I would you know, agree with. I think we could certainly, I mean, from my perspective, you know, endorse everything, recommend everything that they're recommending that that is a capital improvement or zone that might possibly require you know, and use. I'm glad you said that because I figured that you had. My perception is you guys have been debating what fitness programs were going to be at the quarter path when I saw this document. So I think that's a good no, distinction. No. Is no. no, I think the smart thing for us to do is to simply essentially say these are the goals and these are the goals that are relevant to the comprehensive plan. Uh, these are the action items that are relevant to the comprehensive plan. Bullet connecting to the capital trail. Bullet. You know, there's probably two or three on each goal that really okay. do relate exactly to everything that, uh, you know, um, we have uh, purview over. Um, but I agree entirely. I think there's a lot of this that, that we could simply just delete those bullets. Okay. Um, and I think that'll make it an easier document to use. Sure. Also. Yeah, and, and for me, as well as it, because while there's so many bullets here that we're like, wow, you know, and so many don't relate to us, but then... For me, a big wow was the stuff that wasn't there, like the whole city square park. I mean, that park mm. has been laced into downtown vibrancy, and mm. and the Parks and Rec have gotten a hundred thousand dollars to get a mobile project, you know, t a television screen and stage to do all this vibrancy stuff. That's mm. it's not even listed as a park that needs to have anything done. So I mean, mm. so there's not consistency. So I do think we really need to boil down what is sort of the physical infrastructure items that relate to the comp plan. Okay. Well, that's a good point and just worth sort of addressing briefly. Ooh, it, it, that is, is that not a city park? How, and city Square Park is under the park somehow. Yeah, it's on page four, but when it gets back to the <coughs> things to do with different parks, oh, it's, it's, it's not cr listed. It's, it's crickets and mm -hmm. the idea that I don't want to get into the programming but since we got ourselves on the idea of programming, one of the big pieces of downtown vibrancy of programming of this park that's now newly made a park is this whole staging thing, and it's like it's not there. So and they might not have. Okay, so that's yeah. Because that was added. Right. Sure. So, but I mean, I think that that might actually go to us not having such an articulation of bullet points because then someone would say like. Well, why do we have this staging out there, and why are we doing all these programs when it's not part of the comprehensive plan? Because this isn't going to be approved for a whole bunch more time. Mm -hmm. Let me keep it simple. Yeah, simple. Keep it simple. Do you think it's worth, though, then calling out the ones we know relate to, like the specific parks that we know relate to our other goals of downtown vibrancy or relate back to the bicycle infrastructure that we put in the transportation section and things like that I mean should we should we be in this space showing where okay yes we have these standalone chapters but they're the very important to the planning process yes the interconnectivity between our individual chapters is this is this a space to do to do that and make it our own thing that yes calls out the parks plan specifically but says you know here's where to find it or it is in the appendix whatever we decide and then then calls to our own other chapters that we've already worked on and says Here's how parks are integral to urban planning in the community. Okay. 
Yeah, I, I, obviously I, I would, <laughs> but I, I wanted think, to no, gauge that, where that everyone makes, else was that makes on something like that. That makes, yeah. a, that makes a lot of sense, yeah. yeah. Yep. I think I did Open that size. with the chapter we reviewed last mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because I mentioned, say, like High Street. Mm -hmm. I talked about the commercial part, but I mentioned that the residential part look in chapter so-and-so yeah, yeah. I like that. and chapter so-and-so housing. Specifically, transportation, housing, or whatever. Sent you to that chapter to get that information. We could do the same here for infrastructure. Note that in the. Sounds good. So basically, what I heard then is basically say there were four goals, mention the goals, and then do a list by parks, what the improvements might be, and then go um, down to recommendations, so really shorten it up oh yeah. and make I it so. a lot more concise. But right. I think what Aaron was trying to do also is point out the important things that the plan, master plan sh indicated, the commission to be thinking about, mm -hmm. things you might want to add to the recommendations that staff so I told her I bet that these come out based on my <laughs> conversations on the previous chapter, but it was important for you to see them and mm -hmm. look at them and have them in the back of your mind, especially when we get to the, rec the recommendation section at the bottom. So I think we can be similar to what we did. Yeah. In reference I to this plan, say these are the important things that come out of this plan that need part of, like you say, the CIP and the mm -hmm. then if you're in the comprehensive plan and you want to go, like I mentioned before, for those types of things, mm -hmm. it's important to have them listed in the plan. Mm -hmm. System when you, right. mm -hmm. yes, a lot of them now go by scale, so you get so many points. Mm -hmm. So it's important to have things in the comp plan, but maybe not as so we probably get points for actually having a Parks and Rec master plan. Right. Those are points, and then points for the comp plan, yes. right. referencing some of the things, yeah. And I, and I feel real comfortable, you know, endorsing, recommending those things right. that, that are within, as, as Lane said, our, 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 our purview, and mm -hmm. let them get we'll the pickleball funding. We'll go through and pull out the ones that are mm -hmm. capital improvements, essentially. That's, that's yeah, exactly. Or, yeah. And identify those specifically yeah. under recommendations. Yeah, because otherwise this, we're just going to dilute this, you know, mm -hmm. this, this comprehensive plan. And, and I think just to reinforce again, I think some maybe some restraint on these secondary or passive parks with respect to accessibility. Uh, okay. We'll look at uh, see if there's a legal requirement. Of course, but and then yeah. I, I, I guess I think then what we start is redefining our, some of our parks. Yeah, I think <laughs> what, what is the fear that I think lots. some of us have is that we're just using the colloquialism of ADA to right. mean this thing, but okay. these don't actually have that requirement. Yeah. We'll check on that and make sure. Because if great. we have a Thank requirement, you. I think we all stand behind, you know, that support, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, then I'm just going to hit the highlights for the goals okay, three and four. <laughs> um, I think a big one you'll see in goal three is upgrading Wi-Fi service in parks and facilities. That's yeah. something that they've worked on with City Park here is mm -hmm. that you can sit out in the arbor and, and that kind of thing and work on your computer and have good solid internet service. Um, so that's something that they'll they'll continue to work on. Um, I think something else you're gonna see in the CIP is a recreation management software program. Um, and that's going to help them uh, better manage and monitor activities and participation. Um, yeah. I'm not sure if they've investigated that and I don't I can't begin to tell you what I think what IT it would cost. Is looking at that. I know now just about everything is done on paper. In parks and rec. Sign up for a class. Mm -hmm. It's done on paper. Mm -hmm. The receipts are done in oh, paper. Mm -hmm. so it's, uh, but having those metrics are also going to help your grant process right. moving forward. So yes. I think they're they're coming on the new system that everybody's cooking onto in, in the dollar system. So I think they'll be putting that online for those in so that they can do a lot of this. And it helps with coming up with the metrics and counts and who uses the park and types of facilities they use. I think that'll help them do that instead of having. So 
then on to goal four, um, and this will kind of tie back into that conversation again, um, is about increasing financial opportunities. And, and one of the big um, things that they're focusing on here is, is to see what their current programming is, see what they can expand their programming to, and to um, explore opportunities for grants. Um, Was that is that what that third bullet? Because I, I thought grand and philanthropic opportunities sound <laughs> really nice. But as you said that, it's like I oh, that's not what she meant. That's not what she meant. I, I think grand and or just grand <laughs> philanthropic opportunities would be good. Why not? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So the recommendations um, are a bit of a summary of what was included in the goals, what we know is upcoming in the CIP, um, and what staff thought would probably be worthy of discussion. Um, ADA improvements or the accessibility improvements to the parks. So since you're, you're mentioning that one, maybe, maybe we could amplify that just a little bit, you know, um, uh, continue making um, required ADA improvements, meaning referencing those that are specifically required under federal law, and additional accessibility improvements uh, as necessary. So, so it's obvious that we're, we're as, all, as we've been discussing, uh, uh, focused on those going above and beyond what the, what the ADA requires if there's a, if there's a need. Okay. Uh, or a, I think there's a need to even have ADA in that well, the ADA applies no matter, no matter what we say, right? Yeah, yeah so. exactly. It's like, it's like, yeah. I think there's an opportunity for each of these recommendations to kind of expand on them. Um, these are intended to be discussion points, even though there's one specifically called out at the bottom for discussion. Um, but we can certainly kind of add extra wording to make sure that we're covering what well, we yeah, want. Yeah, and, and I don't, because a lot of, a lot of, in my experience, a lot of, Places make ADA required improvements very grudgingly, right? And kicking and screaming sometimes. So mm -hmm. I think I think we want to make the point, as mm -hmm. as Jeff and others made, that that we're you know if there's a need, if there's a desire, you know we want to go beyond just the Be minimum, proactive the minimum, about it. minimum requirements. Yeah, absolutely. As but as appropriate. Yeah. Yeah. Or completely. Well, that's just yeah. That's just it. Right. So the next one discusses repairs and improvements to the tennis courts at Kiwanis Park. Um, I think I've, I should have brought the capital improvement plan um, document with me, but I, I know that that's kind of in the future, um, next few years. Um, conduct a feasibility study on facility expansion <coughs> at Quarterpath Park. Um, that's That was recommended in the plan. It's, I think, been discussed for quite some time now um, and would certainly have the potential to um, make further recommendations for expenses at Quarter Path Park. Are those expansions for like meeting facilities or, or It's a little bit of everything. <laughs> My understanding is, is, is I don't think they're looking necessarily for um, like small room facilities. I think they're looking at gymnasium expansion um, and that kind of thing. Yeah, and, and sitting on the Tourism Development Committee for us, I mean, your, what is it, your number eight piece, I mean, I think both eight and three need to be there, but we need to be strategic in the timing of it because the, the planning for the regional sports complex includes looking at Quarter Path Park as one of the op, uh, one of the places for it to be. So we don't want to do that feasibility study, spend a few hundred thousand dollars or something like that, and then we realize that this other $200,000 feasibility study has said that's the place to be. So. I guess we need them both there in case one goes in one direction, we'll need to do the other, but we need to be strategic in when we do these things. And I don't think in the past we've typically called out timing as far as that goes. Oh, yeah, yeah, um, yeah. No, just... But I do know that, that if we're looking for grant funding to do these feasibility studies, calling them out specifically is going to be really important. Okay. Um, one of the funded um, recommendations is um, the completion of the gym improvements at Quarter Path Park and the replacement of the field fence, the softball field fence at Quarter Path Park. Both of these items are in the CIP. They're kind of lined up and, and coming. I think the gym improvements at Quarter Path Park are nearly complete or have been completed and they're just kind of tying up some loose ends with the contractor. Um, so that should be done uh, relatively shortly. By the so time that, we so get the plan adopted, that might not need to be in here anymore. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah, we need to. We need. We'll need your input on on those that should be deleted. If it's just you know, if there's no action really required by anybody, 
I wanted to, yes, I agree. I wanted to make sure that we called out the ones that we knew were either in process or coming up. Um, but again, if they've been completed by the time we get to the adoption stage, we'll we'll go ahead and pull them out. There's no need to, to, to leave them in there. Um, again, the discussion of shelter and amenity improvements at Waller Mill Park, that's kind of an ongoing process. I know that they have a shelter um, due for replacement this coming year. Um, and that they're making some amenity improvements um, in the CIP. So those are those are things that were, are planned. Um, then we call out the, uh, the recreation management software system, which I think we can leave in there, and then the regional sports complex, which we've all heard about and I think sh probably should stay, but we might be able to kind of expound upon that a little bit um, to kind of clarify the difference between the regional sports complex and the feasibility study at quarter path. Sure. Yeah. So the last item that we have in here, um, a discussion for need for and potential locations for new parks. This might go back to Mr. Tarley's comment about um, dog parks. Um, if, if the commission can think of locations or think of the need for certain parks or certain areas, um, now would certainly be the time to have that conversation. Can that be a Dollar. recommendation that, that <laughs> after I the conference? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm actually like getting brain stunned at this point we, at we six o'clock. The, the crowd will give a standing ovation. But, right um, right but I mean, to me, is that can't that be a recommendation that there's a you know study that, you know or that we do in the, so in the goals? Um, I forget which. Let me go back. I know there's one area in town that we always get park, and that's the capital land. That's one I know, I think, put in the plan. Yeah. Yeah. To investigate. We've shown down at, by the creek park area. Right. Oh, way out way. as you yeah. get close to it. Yeah. yeah. I think the neighbors in there think up towards the intersection of yeah. the Merrimack Trail yeah. and Capitol Land and Road in that neighborhood. Is, doesn't have to be. It doesn't have to be a big park. It doesn't have to be a park with all features in it, but yeah, park in that area. Yeah. Well, well I mean, I, I, on the property. yeah. I mean, it seems like it would be reasonable that there is a <clears> study <throat> to see where there are like park deserts. I mean, you can see with your geographic information system, you know, if you have a population density and you do a three, you know, a one mile, a two mile, a three mile circles, it, you know, is there housing population density and then is there a park in there and if not then that's a, a park desert and we need to think about where they, we have that. That was incorporated in the master plan. I think they actually had that mapped already in the master plan so I guess we could probably include that. Well we can include just some general language about studying the need for additional parks um, and then you know reference you know the recreation master plan you know page whatever that identifies you know areas that are are lacking those facilities. And that's all. <laughs> well, we are at 603, according to Mr. iPhone here. Um, so this is chapter draft two, but we have had enough discussion that we will see this as a draft yeah. three. <laughs> um, there's no one here to have an open forum, so if, no one, if anyone has anything they'd like to add, Say in the negative. Okay, well then we will be adjourned. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you everyone for participating in this long, unexpectedly long meeting. For <laughs> <laughs>